Hi. If we look carefully at the image uh, you can see on the screen at the moment, you can see that we've got some really clear distinctive structures. At first glance, you might think, oh, we've got sedimentary beds. But the rocks you're looking at are igneous. We find them in Greenland uh, in a place called Skergard. This lesson is all about these igneous rocks and the processes that form them. What you're looking at is part of one of the most spectacular uh, and fascinating igneous intrusions in the world. I suppose it's the, the type example, the one uh, all geologists learn about when they're learning about um, layered igneous intrusions. So if we have a look at um, really what Skergard is uh, to start us off. As I said, and as we've seen, it's a layered intrusion. Uh, it's very coarse grained, much three millimeters and much greater than that, clearly indicating a, a, a very slow cooling history. It has a, a mafic composition, uh, very similar to uh, what we see erupting in Iceland today. Um, it's of paleogene age, so that's um, about 55 million years ago. Interestingly, that's the same sort of age as a major period of igneous activity in northwestern Britain. We'll come to that in a moment. And it's the result of partial melting of lithospheric mantle uh, as a result perhaps of decompression. Okay. Um, I've labelled up uh, the location of Skergard there on the east coast of uh, Greenland with a red dot. You can see where we have the Mid-Atlantic Ridge uh, and Iceland there. Um, and we can think a little bit how uh, the hot spot that currently is sitting underneath Iceland may have actually um, had an influence on the formation of Skergard particularly as we can trace a, a ridge running across the Atlantic Ocean um, through Iceland over to um, the northwest corner of Britain. Um, this hotspot has been operating for a long time. When the North Atlantic was um, much narrower than it is now, we would have had a uh, scare guard perhaps on the western side of that hot spot and the northwest of Scotland and Northern Ireland on the eastern side of that hot spot. So that same activity, that same magma source that uh, is currently creating uh, volcanic activity in Iceland created the volcanic activity or the, the igneous activity in uh, Skergard and also the igneous activity uh, that we see evidence for in places like Sky, Mull, the Giant's Causeway, Northern Ireland. Okay. So we need to think how this could have formed, because Skergard is, is a bit different. This is a, a model of how the magma is actually in place. You can see it's a... Um, fault driven process we've got a whole series of normal faults which is what we'd expect with uh, crustal tension related to the opening of the Atlantic Ocean um, we seem to have uh, a large uh, roof block there and the bottom of that um, or the, should I say the top of the basement rock so the bottom of that roof block uh, falling away dropping down because of the faulting and that um, gap then being uh, filled uh, as it falls um, with this magma. It means that we have a lot of magma trapped in this uh, in this chamber, several kilometres below the surface. What we see as a result is what we call a closed system. Um, we see a result of undisturbed crystallisation. So we have 
a big mass of magma injected, intruded into the rocks, um, and then it cools and crystallizes in one um, continuous process, rather than being the subject of multiple phases of intrusion. So we get nothing coming out of this, perhaps no volcanic activity, and uh, importantly, nothing coming into the system either. So we can really uh, get to grips then with the crystallization processes that are going on. What we see as a result is um, an intrusion that looks like this. This is a, a cross section through it. One of the perhaps most striking things is just its, its scale. Uh, this intrusion is enormous. It's incredibly thick. Its size means that we see these clearly defined uh, zones. Uh, I want to look at three of the most important of these. Because we need to think about how these layers actually formed, if it is just one um, intrusion of magma. And also, if we've got a, a, a uniform um, composition of magma being intruded, why then are those layers uh, petrologically different? Why are they made of different minerals? Okay, this is uh, a diagram to try and show uh, some of these processes that are going on. We're going to look at three uh, parts of this. Um, and I'm going to try and simplify it a little bit. This looks you know, complicated, um, but I want us to just try and unpick it bit by bit. We're going to start by looking at what we call the marginal border series, uh, which you can see labelled up uh, on this diagram here. So this is the area closest to uh, the contact with this uh, old, cold, um, nice. It's basement rock. So the marginal border series then is effectively a chilled margin. It's going to be finer grain than the rest of the intrusion. Um, and it perhaps gives us the best indication of what the chemistry of the original melt, the original magma that was intruded was. Because if it crystallizes very quickly, that's going to be representative of, of the material that was going in. It hasn't had time to perhaps sort itself out or split into different parts. The will though, of course, be some contamination from uh, xenoliths. You know, this uh, mafic magma uh, being intruded into uh, more silicic gneiss is inevitably going to melt some of the silica rich minerals, the lower temperature, the lower melting temperature minerals in that gneiss and incorporate those into the magma. The next zone to consider is the lower zone. This very, very clearly layered structure we find uh, down near the base of the intrusion. Here we see uh, layers of dense olivine uh, interspersed with layers of much less dense plagioclase. What we see as a result is what we see is the result of um, the early form minerals, uh, olivine, um, orgites, uh, calcium rich uh, feldspars, crystallizing first. We also then get, as a result of that early forming crystallization, denser crystals settling to uh, the base of the intrusion. The denser it is, the quicker it's going to settle. We also though, because of the size of the Skegard intrusion, have convection. Convection is going to bring those uh, denser crystals down to the bottom of the intrusion. As this is happening of course, we're taking out um, more of the metals compared to um, the silica that's in the melt. So the, the magma that's left 
is going to be changing its composition. It's going to be evolving. The last uh, layer that I want to talk about, the last um, collection of layers, is the upper border series. You can see this. This is what we find at the top of uh, the Skagard intrusion, where it comes into contact with the with the younger um, basalts, the younger um, sediments at the top. And what we see here is uh, a similar pattern, interestingly, to the lower series. So we get an early form crystals uh, forming in layers at the top as well as at the bottom. Now that's perhaps not what we'd perhaps um, think might be the case. And it's this that tells us that actually convection must be an important process within this magma chamber. Because these early form crystals aren't just sinking to the bottom in a, in a still low energy environment. Um, the stirring of the magma chamber by the convection currents is clearly taking some of these early form minerals, pushing them up towards the top of the uh, intrusion, where the, some of them are getting stuck. So we see a similar pattern, although it's a lot less thick than the lower series. Most of these early form crystals are going to find their way to the bottom of this intrusion. Finally, we do see some silicic material within this very mafic intrusion. The last stuff to crystallize, the bits left over, are going to be the most silicic bits. They're the ones with the lowest crystallization temperature, the ones that the bits that are left over when the other metals that are in uh, the melt have all bonded with the silica. So even in this most mafic environments, we can still get silicic rocks. It is, for example, possible to go to Iceland and find rhyolites. That has to be because of this magma differentiation. Those magmas won't be generated as silicic magmas in that environment. So, why is it important? In terms of the pure geology, Differentiation of magma produces a lot of different rock types. It helps us understand these crystallization processes, it helps us understand um, what's actually going on to develop uh, these rocks of distinctly different petrologies. It can also con um, contribute to our understanding of what's actually going on in terms of rock forming processes by plate margins. You know, constructive plate margins, or divergent plate margins, sorry, are an important um, creator of rock. But if we want to get into the applied geology of it, we have some incredibly important, incredibly valuable minerals that are formed within these layered cumulates. Chromite, for example. Our main source of chromite, um, because chromite is one of the early form minerals and it's the main ore of chromium, um, is formed in this way. So, by understanding these processes, we can also understand where we're likely to find really important resources. So, as we watch the sunset, um, at Skergard, uh, with our conclusions obviously in Greenlandic, let's uh, sort that out. This intrusion is incredible. Its scale, its clear uh, evidence of magma differentiation, the clear evidence of uh, convection currents allows us to really get to grips with these processes. Understanding Skergard is the key to understanding an awful lot of these layered igneous intrusions. Don't forget to come up with your interesting question. I'll see you soon.